Hi everyone, welcome to week four. And um, I'm really excited about this one. I say that probably about every one of them, but this is where you really get to get nitty gritty and either make your own revenue model um, or use the one we provide and see what you can do to create revenue and contain costs. And it's really important that we think of those two concepts in tandem. Now, we've been living in the fun world of just revenue creation, which is why last week, that's all I wanted you to do, is just look at how do keys work for anchored formulas. They can be known as either one of them. And how do they work as far as taking a piece of dynamic data, in that case it was COLA, and feeding it through your model. Same thing with the attendance and the revenue, taking those pieces of data and making sure they link, but only for revenue because we were trying to think in abundance and how do we create revenue out of nothing um, and then see, we'll worry about the expenses later. Well, now we're in the, the later part. So now we're gonna talk about how to link, and it's really important, those variable numbers to expenses as well. Because every time we might make a dollar, we may have to spend one in variable expenses as well. Um, the best example of that is food and beverage, of course, because if you add a person to your event, that's great, you might get another ticket sale, but you're going to have to spend to feed them. It's just one, there's a lot of other ones. I'm sure you have tons in your business or in with your executives uh, that, that change those dynamics and you have different factors. So first, I'm just gonna go through um, a couple quick slides to kind of set the tone and set the parameters of what we're trying to do and why, and then I'll go into um, an Excel spreadsheet It'll look familiar and talk through um, some of the ways that we're gonna do this week's assignment. Now, again, this is a time where I'll give a couple um, hints and clues that if you want to do just straightforward, no problem, that is possible in this assignment. If you wanna go a little more advanced because you've been here, done that, and you want some other things to really make this useful for your job, for your project, for a business plan, then um, I'll give some ideas about that too, uh, but you don't have to. So I, I know people are busy doing a lot of things, sometimes just getting to bare minimum understanding is also fine. So I'm gonna share my screen right now and we'll go through these slides and then like I said, we'll be over towards um, the Excel sheet. So we're gonna talk about revenue and cost, containing costs, as well as building this model. Start with a couple questions, talk about the model and its components and steps, revenue and cost containment ideas, audiences and personas, just a call back, just to get refresher on that, event types and journeys, because that really is where we're heading at the end of the course. Questions to consider, how do we ascertain which dynamic events or elements are going to affect our plans, not just for one event, but year on year? Uh, how are we going to show audience growth over time um, or how they're gonna change. Now, this is for my advanced folks specifically. Uh, for everyone in the class, all you have to do is, you know, you can create different audience types and the ticketing prices that might be consistent for the different events you're doing. For the advanced folks, if you would like to create um, a second, I would do it in columns. You can decide how you'd wanna do it for how your event series might grow over time. So maybe, in year one, 2023, you're going to expect more newbies in your audience and maybe they pay less and less experienced, let's say, or, or, or return alumni attendees. Second year, more alumni attendees. Third year, even more and less newbies or some way around that. Maybe create different columns and prices to show those three different year sets of revenue and expenses. That could be interesting. You don't have to do it, but it is a thought if you find this week's exercise um, to be something you wanna push into more. Um, and how are these audiences gonna be fractured? That is truly an event trend that we're seeing right now. I think a lot of people are seeing it in that people are fracturing because they have hybrid, they have virtual, they have in-person, there's budget cuts with businesses. So how are we gonna um, manage and leverage those different things? And then what parts of this economic sea that we're living in are going to experience rapid change from the first, the second, and the fifth? And how can you account for that? So again, models, we're not into budgets. Why? 
it's really for you to be positioned as a strategic advisor. You know, managing to one single budget doesn't allow you the horizon and the view to see how your event might play over time into the entire objectives and KPIs of a company. You know, if they're really looking to grow this particular customer base, well, you could do that over a series of events. It's far more difficult to pressure that one objective into one event. So it takes the pressure off of a single event and a single budget. That gives a little more breathing room around the flexibility of the money that might be available, the investment dollars might be available, because now you're showing, hey, this is a long-term plan. There are multiple touch points with the audience, and I can show you why this makes sense over the long term, not my single event. So it gives you more opportunities for more money, but also more opportunities to position yourself as a strategist. So the model. Okay, these steps are very important as you build it. Again, if you're my folks who have done it forever, this is just one way. It's, it's the way we came up with, but um, you can feel free to you know, customize this to what's gonna be useful for your particular um, business or company. First thing I do is I create tabs for each type of event. By type of event, I mean, is it a virtual? Is it an in-person? Is it a regional event? Is it a VIP event? What kind of event is it? And it has its own expenses, almost like its own little department. Why? Because in my mind, this is just my head, it quantifies that I wanna make sure I'm accounting for the audiences that are variable to that expense and that budget, that it's a lot easier for me to check. If it's this is in person checking back to my revenue or my dynamic tab, than if it was just one long spreadsheet. That's just me. So I will show you that when we go to the Excel uh, document. Then once I have all those done, I create a tab and I'm working from this way over. <laughs> um, I create a tab for audience and revenue. That's my term. You could also just put dynamic elements. What is gonna be dynamically changing, uh, be that COLA, be that attendance is usually the one, as I gave the example, that has the most dynamism, but what are the things you want to be able to change and update throughout your entire set of tabs? You could put inflation here and then link it to every single expense number that you think was going to be affected by inflation. Could be all of them, or it could just be the bottom line of each of those tabs. Um, or you could link that as it kind of flows through over to your projections tab. You could do that a bunch of different ways. That's why I'm saying do what makes sense for your mind, but just make sure you're capturing the dynamic elements. And I make mine yellow, and we'll talk about that when I go to the Excel. Create a tab for risks. If you want to go to advanced, uh, advanced level, we're covering more of that in um, five, but you could already get ahead of it and create a tab for risks or you can add that to your dynamic elements tab. What is going to be risky, changing, and dynamic that could potentially affect all of your different events? Then I keep going to the left, uh, my left, and I create a historical projections tab. Now that really, that comes back, harkens back from my days in Charles Schwab back in 2002. Um, and that was, uh, we were always asked to give presentations with some sort of historical data so that our executives could look at, okay, here's the historical, here's the projections. So they weren't operating in an information vacuum. So it was a million, so now it was 2 million last year. Okay, now I see why you're projecting it's gonna be 2.1 or something like that. Um, so we always had that. You don't have to if that's not a part of your business. And then going left again, executive summary. And what I always say to my staff is, we wanna keep any executive in the first three tabs. We never want them to go into our event expenses tabs. First tab, executive summary. What's the bottom line? What, how much money am I gonna get? Okay, how does that relate to the past and why do you think it's gonna go there in the future? Jump over to my historical projections tab. All right, I see what you mean, but where are you getting this revenue? Jumping over to my audience and revenue tab. That's it. If we go past that into line item expenses, I know I've lost the battle, I've lost the war. Because anyone who's gonna question us on, were we able to, I don't know, figure out catering, um, you know, we, we've lost. We wanna stay in that big picture thinking and basically does this model make sense? Is this something you'd wanna do? Part one, create your tabs. That is the first step. Part two, 
This is the part we didn't do last week that I was waiting for this week. I like to break revenue and then expenses into two weeks. Um, that happened a while back. That seemed to be the better way. So apologies to any of you that were really wanting to <laughs> look at those expenses because they were not ready for prime time. Um, but now what we're looking at is every single, again, time you wanna make a dollar here that's predicated on an audience member that's going to cost you dollars, then you have to make sure that variable amount is linking to your revenue and it's linking to your expenses or you'll have an inflated view of your revenue. So we don't want that. So I go through for my system and I mark every single expense in my tabs, what is fixed and what is variable. What is going to be affected by that attendance so that when I raise it, these raise too, and the costs of the attendance raises. And then I make sure that those expenses are linked all the way to, um, yeah, the revenue and attendance. That's part two. Part three. Test it. This is a fun part. <laughs> you should be able to input your numbers. I got 5,000 attendees and I try to make it pretty ridiculous because this is how you can test well to see if you messed up. So put that you have a million attendees or a hundred thousand attendees, everything better wildly inflate. And that's why I use big numbers to test. Because if you use little numbers to test, you might not know, there might be one little expense that you're not gonna notice if it's off by 50 bucks, but if that attendance starts to go up, wow, it would be a real break between those two things. So input crazy numbers anywhere, again, I use yellow and your yellow numbers or whatever color you have, and check all your tabs that should have updated, projections, executive summary, and go to the bottom of those event tabs of their expenses. They should have wildly jumped as well. And then you can start to see, is there anything I forgot? Part four, all right, you've done the tabs, you've done all the variables, you've linked it, you've tested it. Now's the fun part, that's the totally fun part. You get to make recommendations. Figure out the best recommendation and combination of event types, three virtuals, uh, a, a satellite event, maybe what you do is subscriptions, you're gonna do subscriptions across the board and you think 20% of all the audience that would normally attend your event is gonna subscribe to an event series. Ensure they're linked to the executive summary tab. You should only have links for data on the summary tab. That's how I check it. So I'll go down cell by cell and make sure there's no typed number. If there's a typed number on your executive summary, you could justify it and say why. There's always exceptions, but um, usually 99.9999% of the time, that executive summary is just to collect all that data, summarize it beautifully into, here's my recommendations for revenue, Here's the expenses associated with it. Here's your gross profit and your percentage of gross profit or whatever your company might need. And then write a few sentences about why you decided to do that. And um, you can write it right there on the Excel uh, spreadsheet or you can write it where you submit your assignment in the box. I don't mind, whatever's easy for you. And note, you do not have to make money on this. You could put your entire company in the hole by half a million dollars if you think, hey, this is important. We lost all these attendees and customers um, and partners over COVID. We've got to get them back. It's worth a half a million dollar investment because next year, this is where looking ahead is really in your favor. Next year, I think we're going to get back double uh, and we'll make $2 million. I don't know. So you don't have to make money. Just justify it. <laughs> um, okay. So that is the assignment. I'll go through the Excel tab in a minute. Don't worry that Excel spreadsheet. Here's just a little bit of background to hopefully help you when you are doing that. Start with the audience first. We've already talked about that. This is kind of a callback slide. Um, what do they want? How can we build it? Um, and how can we price it? We've heard about subscriptions and memberships. You could add that in. And I just wanna bring up a real quick story. <laughs> I was telling to a friend of mine um, and about this class. And I said, well, would you rather subscribe or be a member to Netflix? And they said, well, subscribe because I pay the $14 every month. It's easy, I don't think about it and it's not some big amount. I said, so you wouldn't pay 300 bucks a year for it, you know, just one time. No, nope, I wouldn't. Okay, great. What if, I know this person likes Stranger Things, what if uh, you were, if you became a VIP member, $300 one time per year, and you were entered with 10 tickets into a sweepstakes to go to the premiere of Stranger Things, and they sent you a t-shirt and a hat, or just a t-shirt. I said, now would you become a member? She goes, oh yeah, of course I would. So all of a sudden you could increase the value and you could increase the amount of money that is possible 
That's just one example. It can also flip on its head. If you're doing memberships, sometimes doing subscriptions can really do the same thing. And then over a long period of time, how do you view their journey? Maybe Netflix should reward its most loyal viewers. You know, if you've been a viewer of Netflix, you're going to get one month free, anything like that. Um, or see if they're going to grow with your event. Like I was saying with kind of the idea of freshmen, sophomore, juniors that are attending your event, do they grow over time and how do you serve their different uh, educational needs? And what do they need from the company? We always need to ask what's in it for them. So now when we think about cost containment, again, we're thinking we're kind of moving from revenue, but we're always thinking about these two in tandem. Um, how can we reduce costs? There's a great article about cost containment, a lot of different ideas. Some of them will not be new to any of you. It's just refreshing our, our memories to think about them, maybe causing some aha moments. Um, bulk or long-term agreements, usually that's a procurements game to, to lock in those over time. Um, can we shift cost to our customers? Eventbrite does that really well. You know, you can, you buy a ticket and, um, sometimes the concert or whoever else, uh, puts the cost of that on you. Same with that special handling fees. Hotels are doing a lot of that now. Um, and can we use creative scheduling or venue choices in our favor? A lot of you do that already. Um, you know, you stop before lunch, you don't have to feed people. Um, you start after breakfast, you just give them coffee. So there's a lot of scheduling that we can do that can um, move the bar on cost containment creatively and in small ways. And then I always like to think about um, how can we build with a buyer or a partner in mind? And I put egos here because I was thinking about Netflix and I thought, you know, it'd be a great thing to do a Netflix event. See if you could get Ego to sponsor. Yes, money plus product always best. But even if they just provided product to serve Ego waffles, and wipe off a line of your F&B budget, that's gonna contain your costs for that event. Just another way to think about it. Uh, and a fun fact, one of the coolest, hippest cocktail bars in LA that serves late, 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 to like three in the morning, uh, they serve Eggo waffles and you can buy them, uh, what is it, three, five bucks each. So you get three and it's $15. And when you're there at 2 a.m. and you need some food, that sounds like a great deal. And they come with all sorts of crazy toppings, you know, jalapeno and maple syrup or whatever, they sell a ton. So anyway, just had to bring that up because it also makes me think of, of Eggo waffles. Um, but how can you leverage certain things like that to remove a hard cost? Um, I think anytime we can do that, it's a great way of containing. And then leverage the needs of a venue or location. You know, what kind of dates do they need to fill? All things we know how to do. Uh, fun fact about uh, Eggo waffles there too, increase of 14% because of Stranger Things and how that's featured in the show. Audiences and personas, again, a callback, but again, thinking about revenue, uh, customize them for your audience. Maybe you have certain personas that are very concerned and uh, hesitant to travel or go to an in-person event because of COVID and that might flare up again or whatever might flare up again. I mean, there's lots of things that are always risks. You can offer ticket insurance. Um, same with ticket layaway. We've got a lot of economic pressures that maybe people don't want to make the big spend for a conference ticket right now, but maybe they would do a layaway. I mean, as a 70s kid, that that is how I grew up. So um, I think it's an excellent idea that a lot of folks are starting to use in different ways. Um, I think of the term layaway, I'm sure there's a bunch of other terms. Achievement incentives. Um, we the Children has a great way of doing this. You wouldn't have to use this uh, exact service example, but it might get your mind thinking that We the Children offers the opportunity for high school kids to do service and they have to do so many service projects. I forget exactly how it's, how it's metriced or tracked um, so that they can get a ticket or an invitation to go to this We the Children massive a 30,000 person conference or something where they have huge musical acts and all of that. So it's a reward for the work for this ticket. Uh, same with give to get. Um, there's ways you do service to get a ticket to a rock concert, which is kind of cool. Um, bundled opportunities. Maybe you could wrap up all these tickets and one of your tickets on your revenue sheet could be uh, bundled one in person and two virtuals and they get a discount, but you're gonna get the cash flow up front. Gift purchases, uh, depending on what kind of events you do, you could always offer a gift ticket. Or maybe it's a ticket uh, as a gift to the night before, and that can be 
packaged as a gift so like spouses or significant others or whatever would feel like they're actually invited and this is a, a gift uh, purchase that maybe um, the person going to the event could offer. Early entry, we know it's used a lot, especially with exhibitor halls, booths. Maybe you could use that to your benefit for something that you're doing uh, that isn't an exhibit hall uh, that might benefit from early entry or things like that. And then long tail extras, what do they get after the fact? You know, maybe when they get home, they get X, Y, or Z. And I always say at the very bottom, if you wanna learn about sales techniques or thinking about how to add revenue or get a sale in the door, go to a used car lot and try very hard not to buy a car. Maybe I'm just influenceable, but I find it very difficult because they have excellent strategies. Hybrid versus live, just another way of thinking and perspective as you're thinking about different revenue streams, or how you might monetize. I know a lot of folks are saying it's going away, it's not going away. There's always gonna be some components for certain personas that are going to need some of this. Um, and if nothing else, just because of practicality, travel, being able to leave. So hybrid, we're calling it live plus. And think about the different ways, asynchronous, synchronous. I think synchronous is the most expensive. So cost containment, maybe you pull it into asynchronous, definitely a way of, of uh, chopping down costs. A couple other ideas on the slide. And then lastly, again, thinking about this event types and journeys, which is what we will get to at the end of the course. Uh, pick an endpoint objective. Where do we want to be by 2030? Where do we want to be by 2025? What is the time frame and what are we trying to accomplish with who by the time we get there and why? And the why absolutely needs to have it because we're going to make money. Um, sometimes there are answers on the way to that. <laughs> we're going to engage people because it's got to end up at money. ROI. What is the return on the money that was invested? How do we get there? And then just a, a small little uh, item I thought I'd place here is something we did for a client, which showed how we saw their synchronous events happening, what kind of event, what type, what goals would that fulfill and what audience would that touch. Same with asynchronous. And then our next step after this slide was to start to plot those out and to plot the trend line towards how we thought the audience would change, how we thought their goals would be accomplished by an end point. So that's just a a quick example from us. So that is it for the um, slideshow. And now I'm going to pop over to the illustrious um, financial model. Let me get there. All right. So this will look familiar to you. I know it will. And I'm just going to go through again what those steps were. Um, and I start again with the event types. At the bottom, you can see that I've got satellite, I've got virtual, I've got in-person, and then I build my revenue, my historical, my executive summary. That's how I started. Then, as you can see from this um, tab on the in-person, I went down and I did my fixed and variable all the way down, right? All the way down. And then I made sure that that, let me move this up just a teensy bit, um, was going to, make this a little smaller, um, to the end, and I went through every single one of my stuff. Then I want to check and make sure that these link. And the first thing you can see is um, this one I corrected. But if I had not had this linked, I'm actually going to remove this link because I would like to show you something. So. On here, if I just had, if I had gone through and I had, let's see, this mod, model two um, number for my satellite was 27.5, that seems reasonable, sure. And then I went over here to virtual, I made it pretty short, and we just have, you know, uh, virtual, it's more like small uh, because it only has 5,000, and then we did a virtual big, I could call it large, but I like big. Uh, where we would get 10,000 people. And then I've got my in-person and I put all my variables. And the first thing I'm noticing is, is that there might be some misses on whether, because right here, wait a second, that's a nice formula for my variable, but this doesn't look right and it's not. 
anything that has a variable over in that column L, there should be a formula in your spreadsheet. So now, especially if this one has a formula and it's off the key of the attendance, right? Let me go here. So you can see right there, 100% attendance, variable event, and it is keying off of that. And then you can quickly see that there's a mistake because over here, well, it's just a number. Well, where did that number come from? When things are typed in and they don't have a fixed over here, you know something has probably gone horribly wrong. So this is something to watch out for because that would mean that my expenses are artificial as opposed to my revenue. That is something that can happen in a, in a uh, financial model unless you do these steps. Now, if you wanna get fancy, this is for my advanced folks, you can do some really cool things with doing an if-then statement to capture your total variable costs and your total fixed costs per event type. Don't have to do that. That is not required. That's just if you're an advanced type person in this stuff and you're like, you got this, then I would recommend just doing a quick, interesting uh, bottom line sum of your variable cost versus your fixed cost. It's always good to know that no matter what, when a client or an executive starts down the road of doing an event, how much they are definitively going to spend no matter who comes and your fixed costs are going to give you that. Now for everyone else, you don't have to do that. But what I am telling you to do is look out for any number that if you put a variable, it better be linked to attendance. So that column H is a problem. Now, there is one other problem which I wanted to show you on the satellite because catering is a variable cost. And we have an attendance, we have per person, it's gonna cost $125. Well, we need a variable and we need to link that to attendance. So I'm gonna do an equals. I'm gonna go over to my revenue and attendance and see what I've estimated for attendance. Well, there's a hundred, boop. And now, no, it's supposed to times, what is it doing, times that. There we go, that's right. So for my model two, my satellite, I'll talk about why I was working on the model two here. Uh, it should be actually forty thousand dollars, so it's twenty two six twenty five. This is a useless number, absolutely useless. I'm just going to delete it. Doesn't mean anything <laughs> because I didn't multiply by my attendance, so that subtotal was a red herring. So now I know that this is forty thousand. I also know that if I update this over on my um, attendance key, this will update. And since this is linked back, I not. I don't really have to worry about this tab at all. I'm done with this tab. Virtual, going to the left. There are some variable variables here, but I just have them as a flat number. Now, the reason why is because I didn't want to build out why I want to vary my facilitators and all of this, but you should. <laughs> this is more of just, I was going through this as an example, um, but you should, and I knew these were about you know, 3X, 4X, so I just popped them in here as numbers. But this, if you really start to get fancy, you would want to link this with variable costs and maybe decide what your multiplier is gonna be. So if you do 10,000 attendees, make up a variable, maybe it doubles off the 5,000 and just put two over on your revenue and attendance. I just didn't do that this time, but that is what you need to do because again, that will show you Anything variable, you, I shouldn't make it yellow because that's what my updating color is. I'll make it blue. Um, you need to make sure that it is linked to a dynamic figure. In person, you already know where the issue is there. Um, so those variables would have to be updated if you'd want to use those. And then let's go over to revenue and attendance. So on revenue and attendance, Everything is as you saw it before. You can update these. You can create different, uh, you know, different types of audiences. You can do all sorts of things. Down here at Satellite Model 1, I'll just tell you what we were trying to do. <laughs> and what we were trying to do for the client is they said, hey, should we just 
charge anybody who wants to have a satellite event, take our live stream feed, get our workbooks, a $10,000 license fee. They could do it on their own. We don't care how much it costs. Not a problem. Here's your workbooks and here's our live stream feed. Or should we take on the cost of having facilitators in these different cities, you know, the F&B, the catering and making it kind of a big deal, maybe a hundred people or so, which one is best for us? And this is a great example of when a model is appropriate. This is a dinky one that's kind of tacked into this whole other big model. But model one, of course, is just the revenue is $10,000. That's it. That's the revenue, um, or at least that they decided. And then for model two, you've got to build out more of like an event. So let's say we did 100 person attendance. The cost um, is 40,000 because that's pulling now off of my correct expenses. Remember, because it wasn't correct because it wasn't keying off before. So now I know it's correct. And then I put $200 ticket price, which gives me $20,000 in revenue. So let's just see what that does. We go over to historical projections. I'm going to go past all of this. You've seen it all. And I'm going to go over to these satellites. So model one is just $10,000. And I'm saying we're going to do three of them, three cities. So you get $30,000. There's no expense. I'm going to assume for the purposes of this course, the workbooks are already printed and are, are parsed to a different department. So a different department paid for the workbooks. So it's literally zero cost, maybe an email. Then model two, we really do it as an event. We're taking ownership of this. So we're going to make $60,000. And then this is, and that is, um, where did I get 63 or 60,000? Oh, that's right. I had to multiply my revenue by three. But wait, there is a mistake. That's why I've made this orange so we could see what happens if I had left something like this. This is not multiplied by, th by three. And again, it, the expenses, the point of this lesson is the expenses must be multiplied by the variable as well. So now I do times three because the expenses are times three. And what does that do to me? Oh, I went 60 grand in the hole. Well, that was a mistake that was worth finding. So what if I wanted to see if there was a way to make model two work? And if my client said, hey, we really want to take control of this. So you need to help us out. Like you, you need to help show us how we can do that. All right. Well, let's see. What if we made it? You like a uh, client. Um, you prefer intimate, more high ticket events. And so let's make it 50 people. But we're only, but we're going to charge a thousand dollars per ticket. But it's going to be really a big deal for this satellite event. An incredible facilitator, content. Now you could make forty-eight thousand dollars. So, what's the lowest you could go? Uh, let's see. Instead of a thousand dollars, let's do eight hundred and see if that works. Let me go back over here. Yeah. So. And that to me is probably the margin I'd want them to keep. So if you just want to almost, you know, do it because this is a valuable exercise, charge everyone 800, do 50 people, and you're going to come out on top a bit, not a lot. So that's just how um, you can use this. You can work this. Here's the executive summary where you would just, you know, type in what this was, a uh, virtual event for 20,000 because... And then you're going to do a formula here. I'm just going to do formula. And then same, same, same. You're going to sum that. Sum, same for this. Sum, and then uh, do a, a grand total and a gross profit. That's it. So I hope that explains the, the way of building a model. Get just one model. There are a million ways to build these. So if you find a way that works for your brain, the most important principle here is put the dynamic data in one place. And if it is matched to revenue and it is going to cost you to get the revenue, match it to expenses. That's it. Um, the step-by-step -step, uh, instructions for the assignment are in there, but I know a couple of you have sometimes contacted me about how to make it more relevant for your industry, for your sector, for your project you're working on. That's fine. Shoot me an email. Shoot me an email and say, hey, I get this, but could I customize it for this? Because I'm actually going to use it. Yes, please. Uh, this course is not meant to be uh, for trivia sake or for busy work. I'm really hoping it's going to apply to your day-to-day -day life and to 
what your aims and goals are uh, with your career or with your job. So happy to have you customize something. Just let me know what you're, what you're up to, what you're doing, um, but more than open to that. All right. Thanks so much. And I will see you hopefully at office hours.